Good morning, Life Church. We're so glad you braved the snow with us this morning. And good morning to all of our Life Online attendants today. We wish uh, we were in our jammies with you this morning as well. We have a few less people on stage this morning due to the snow, but we're going to give it our all. We hope you will too. Please stand and worship with us. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, all hail King Jesus, all hail the Savior of the world. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners for every curse is blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake. And the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made. The heavens roared. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Spirit washed in his blood, perfect submission, all is at rest. I in the Savior. worship. Thank you so much for being in the midst of us. God, please anoint Mike and his words. Let us speak to our hearts this morning. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Opposition. Nobody wants to be opposed. 
the follower of Jesus Christ does not want to be opposed. But opposition is exactly what we're promised. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. Opposition is what separated Joseph from his family and threw him into a prison. It's what pushed Moses and the Israelites up against the Red Sea. It plotted the genocide of God's people in Susa during the time of Esther. Opposition towered over a shepherd boy with a slingshot, and it came out in droves of soldiers against the King Jehoshaphat. Elijah stood opposed by 450 prophets of Baal. Opposition executed God's prophets, beheaded John the Baptist, and stoned Stephen outside the city. It presses in on the church today, prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But do not be scared. Take courage. The enemy hates those who fear the Lord. We know that Satan is the prince of the power of the air and oversees spiritual forces of evil. He orchestrates and motivates many forces against the follower of Jesus Christ, but fear him who after he is killed has the authority to cast into hell. Steady your heart in the fear of the Lord, firm in the promise of his salvation. Do not be scared, take courage. It was courage that allowed Joseph to wait with patience in his prison until the appointed time of Israel's preservation. It caused Moses to part the Red Sea so they could walk on dry land. Courage accompanied Esther into the throne room of the king to save God's chosen people and took down a giant with a smooth river stone. It filled Jehoshaphat to rout the Moabites and Elijah to call down fire from heaven. Courage gave John the Baptist faith to make a way for the Lord and Stephen to see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Courage led the Son of Man to Golgotha, where opposition made its final stand and fell defeated at the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's courage that fills us today to resist the enemy, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by our brotherhood throughout the world. Opposition will come, but stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. All right, good morning. Good to see everybody here. As you, uh, if you've been coming for a while, you know, obviously we narrowed down the seats because we had no idea who was going to come or not come and we had calls sometime yesterday is church gonna cancel and I was like this is just crazy I didn't even know we we're supposed to get snow so I hadn't even thought about it you know and then in the same concept of all of that just for all of you guys that are here or online uh, this hasn't happened for a while where people have even asked us I don't even have snowed at all last year but anyway here's how it works at life we only cancel if you're going to get arrested driving here. So there's some level that goes out, whatever that level is. You know, if you're going to get arrested for driving here, we'll probably close the church. Other than that, we're open. So you can come, you know, if you can make it. So glad for all of you guys that could make it today. If you can't make it, we are glad that you guys are with us online and that you could join us online uh, for our online church. So we are in the second week of our series called Mastermind. And again, I'm really excited about this series for a couple different reasons. But one, I think it's fitting for the time. You ever have that where it just seems like when you're talking about something, it's like God, you know, orchestrated it and it just fits the time we're in, right? Like we got to figure out what's going on because the idea behind Mastermind is this. This is what we talked about last week. There is a battle for your mind, right? So people are trying to dictate the way that you think. Okay? Now, why would anybody want to dictate the way that you think? Here's why. And people have known this for years. If they can change the way that you think, it'll dictate the actions of your life, right? So however you think changes the way that you act. If we can change the way that you think, we can change the way that you act, which is crazy. Culture has known this forever. Wherever I can get somebody's undivided attention, I will invest millions of dollars to change the way that you think, right? Have you seen lately all the people uh, that have pulled their ads from the Super Bowl? 
Have you seen that? Anybody seen that? Like all of the popular ads, like everybody, or commercials, like that used to be the thing after the Super Bowl, who had the best commercial. Why would anybody spend $5 million for one minute? Right? Well, it's easy. They get it. The most viewed event in, in the world is the Super Bowl. We will have your undivided attention during the Super Bowl. We will spend whatever it takes because it has proven that when we have your undivided attention, if we do the right commercial, it can get you to react by do in a certain way. Now here's what they've realized. That is nobody even watches commercials anymore on TV. Right, so why spend $5 million when we can spend nothing and be on Facebook? Spend nothing and be on YouTube? Spend nothing and be on TikTok? Spend nothing and be on Snapchat? Why would we ever spend $5 million? They found a new way to get your undivided attention. But it still doesn't change. Everybody's seeking the platform that has your undivided attention. Because they know once they have it, if they change your ideology or the way that you think, it'll change the way that you act. Okay. That same concept is what Scripture talks about all the time. That's why Scripture said there is a battle for your mind. Because Satan knows that if he can get your undivided attention and cause you to think a certain way or distract you or to do whatever, he knows that it can change the actions of your life. Right? So he knows that if he can get you to think a certain way, act a certain way, you know, if he gets you to think a certain way, you will act a certain way. So he's trying to change your ideology. And so last week we said, hey, there's a battle for your mind. And so you better know that because everybody knows this, I hope. Nobody goes into a battle unprepared, right? I hope. <laughs> if not, please don't be on my team. You know, I want the people that, that know like to prepare if there's a war coming. I want the people on my team that would be like, if somebody's going to attack my house, you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be ready for the attack, right? I'm not going to just let them come in because I didn't really have time to get around to it. If I know there's a real attack coming, I'm going to prepare to be ready for the attack. These weeks that we're going to be talking about following this, you know, or today and on in this Mastermind series is, okay, if there is a battle for your mind, you better get ready, Right? You better get ready for the attack. You better figure out what to do and how to prepare um, because the, the attack is, is enemy. Right? The attack's coming, right? You, don't, you already know that it's coming just like what we talked about, you know, what you saw in that video. There is going to be persecution, right? And so here's what we're going to talk about today. You ever have those people, so we're going to teach today how to stand firm, you know, in, in life, because part of this reason is, is that Paul knows that there are going to be times in your life that whatever comes your way, you're going to, if you're not or don't have a solid foundation, whichever way the wind blows you, you're going to go. You know, and I've always said this, one of the things I can't stand is people that just are two-faced. Say what you want to your face, you know what I mean? They make you happy and like shake your hand and say everything and then they go to the other guy and they just whatever makes them happy and they don't stand for anything. You know, that drives me nuts. I would rather you just be a man and say it to my face, you big baby. You're out there talking to everybody else. Like, well, you're not enough of a man just to say what you think. I got broad shoulders. You don't like me. You don't like what I'm saying. You don't have to tell anybody else. I'm here, you know. I'm not that far away. Like, you don't have that, no problem with that because I can't stand people that just get swayed right? And whatever comes blowing in, they're going to go over to the popular side to make everybody happy because they think the objective is life is to keep everybody peaceful and happy. I'm like, that's a terrible objective, right? The objective should never be to just keep everybody happy. Paul says the objective is life, of life is to stand firm in what you believe. Knowing this, because he already, this is just a given. One promise that scripture gives us is, if you stand for something, you will be opposed, okay? If, which is what I told you, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, if you go where I think a lot of people are today, which is the lukewarm side, you don't really stand for anything. You're really not cold or hot. You know, you're not really on fire for Jesus, and you're not really like against Jesus. You're just kind of like, I'll just keep going down the road. Just to give you a little heads up, read Revelations because in Revelations there's this story about people who are lukewarm 
And if you haven't read it, let me give you the end of the story of what Jesus says he does with lukewarm people. He spits them out of his mouth, right? So what Paul's saying is, listen, if you stand firm, hot, for Christ, what he has said, what the truth is, there is going to be opposition. It is coming. But in the midst of all of this, you, are know, you know that in what you believe is what's going to keep you anchored to this spot. Because if you don't believe in anything, you will be shifted in the wind whatever popular culture is or whatever popular opinion. So today, we're going to work on training your mind to be focused on or to stand firm in what Scripture tells us so that our mind, as we train it, doesn't get swayed with whatever popular opinion is. So if you have a Bible, turn to Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians 4. So in Philippians 4, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 9. So Philippians 4, 6 through 9, and here's a little bit of what was going on in the Philippian church, okay? So if you remember, you know, some historical facts about it, the church in Philippi was the first church ever planted by Paul in Europe, you know, so if you like history, that's a little bit of history, the first one that's ever planted in Europe, but it had some unique challenges and some unique things about it. One of the unique things about the church in Philippi, if you read throughout all of Paul's writings, it's the church that he calls generous, right, because it's the church that supported his ministry even though they were poor, because there was a, that culture in, in Philippi was very poor, but they kept supporting in, in places like Corinth and Ephesus that were very rich, never gave him any money. Right, so he says, you know, the church in Philippi was very generous, but it also had some, some big challenges. One of those challenges were they were very poor. Now think about this. So Paul goes to them and gives them the gospel, okay? They receive the gospel, and when you receive the gospel in Philippi, persecution is coming, right? So now you go to church and you could be put in jail or now you go to church and you could be beaten or now you go to church and you could be killed or now you go to church and your children could be taken away from you, right? So persecution is happening. So life gets interrupted. At the same time, persecution when they are living out their faith for Christ and when you go home, you have to worry about what you're going to eat because there is no food, right? You have to worry about trying to find a job to be able to provide for your family because there wasn't very many jobs, right? You have to worry about how to keep a roof over the head of your family. So now think about this for a second. This was the struggle of the Philippian church. I'm not very happy <laughs> because it's one thing to be persecuted and still be able to come home and eat dinner like there's something in the fridge. It's one thing to be persecuted and still be able to come home and, and be able to provide a roof over the, the, the head of your children, right? Like it's one thing to be persecuted, but when life completely sucks, you ever had those moments where it's not only persecution, but it's not going good at home? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like things aren't going the way that they're supposed to be. The Philippian church would go to Paul and say, you know, it was one thing to be poor. You know, it was one thing to, to not have a job, but at least I wasn't getting put in jail. At least my kids weren't getting taken away from me. And at least I wasn't getting beaten with rods. And at least my, you know, husband wasn't, you know, going missing now. Now we're poor and persecuted. That's a recipe for a not very fun life, right, in their mind. Like, things aren't going very good. So they would go to Paul and be like, wow, it's so hard because we're struggling so much. And Paul says to them, and this is really important, understand this, right? Your life was never about happiness. Like, you might have missed this. He says, I'm going to teach you something greater than happiness. I'm going to teach you joy. And they're like, joy, what's the difference between joy and happiness? And he tells them, this is the difference. Happiness is determined by the circumstances of life, right? Circumstances of life are good, you are happy. Circumstances of life are bad, you're, yeah, I mean, things aren't good. And so because you want to be happy, you want to control the circumstances of life so that you can make them all good so that you can be happy most of the time. So you try to form this resemblance of control, right? So you try to control your circumstances to make sure your circumstances go the way you want them to go because if they go the way you want them to go, then you're going to be happy at the end of it. And Paul says, listen, two things that are a problem with that. Who you are and how you live this life cannot be determined by the circumstances of life. And you have to remember this, whether you like this or not, you're not in control. 
you don't get to control the circumstances of life, right? You don't get to control everything that's outside of you. As much as I want to, <laughs> you know, I want to control all of the circumstances. I want to be in charge. I want to make sure everything goes the way I want it to go. I have to remember, I'm not in control. And then Paul would say to me, and so because you understand the sovereignty of God and you're not in control and everything filters through the hand of God, you should be joyful in the Lord. Well, what gives us joy when life is not the way that it's supposed to be? How can we have joy? And this is what Paul would tell the church of Philippi and what he's telling us today. Our joy is found in the Lord because, here's, this is so cool, right? At the end of the day, this world, and, and I'm not sure that it's not, could just completely go berserko, right? Like everything could go wrong and everything could collapse. And, and at the end of the day, everything could go against everything that we think is right. But at the end of the day, I will spend eternity with the Lord. And so will my children who know the Lord and my friends that know the Lord and the people around me that know the Lord. So my biggest focus is not trying to change the inevitable, the collapse of the world. Like I'm gonna be involved and I wanna make, fix it to wherever I can, but at the end of the day, you know what my biggest priority is? To see you again. Because I already know it's collapsing, <laughs> right? I don't know if it's gonna happen in my time or my kid's time or like someday it's inevitable. He already said it right, that it's coming, and again, not saying that we're not change agents, we don't want to do something different, but at the end of the day, saying to the Philippian church, and this is hard to get, but you have a short time on this earth, right, it just goes by, anybody that's older, we're like, I wonder where all the time went, how did my kids grow up, and now they have kids, and grand you know what I mean, you're like, what in the world, and I know when you're a young parent, you think, this is never going to get out of this, you do, <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah, it yeah, things go, and we just forget, but time flies that we have here on this earth, so he says, don't waste your time. And if you do that, you will find joy in the Lord, but if you're trying to find happiness in the circumstances of this world, good luck, you know, because it's ever-changing, and it's very fickle, and so he gives them that, and he says this, I want to help you understand how to have a foundation that's never-changing, because when you're swayed like the reeds, and when you go to different places, not only is that difficult on you, you become at a place, now don't miss this, where you are no longer useful. I can't use people that one day are over here and then one day are over here that they just get swayed with popular opinion and they get swayed with whatever people want. Like I can't use people like that. I need people that are anchored and that I can use them, and if you'll let me do that, it'll change the world. So that's the history of what was going on in the Philippian church. Now, let's see how he taught them, right? Now, he's laying a foundation, battlefield for the mind, right? Now, we gotta work on this training process of how to get ready for the battle. So the way that he helps them get ready for the battle starts with uh, what it says in verse six. So it says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So he says right from the beginning, don't be, don't be anxious. anxious. Thank you. What makes us anxious? When you lose control, <laughs> Right? Every time things get out of control, you're like, mm, what can I do? I got to bring it back in. I got to make it. And you're trying to fix it all. And all of a sudden, the anxiety gets to a place where once control is out of your hands, you just get to the place where you're anxious. And you know why he starts with this? And I think this is vitally important. When you lose control, when those things happen, when something doesn't go right in your life, what you turn to determines who you trust. Does that make sense? So something goes wrong. The first thing that you turn to determines where your trust lies. So Paul's saying, I want to teach you a principle. If I'm going to be able to teach you anything else, I've got to figure out who you trust. Right? Because if you don't trust the Lord, then this is just a knot of information. Right? I've got to teach you that when life goes haywire, 
when life gets out of control, you need to turn to the only one who is truly in control, right? So it's not only who do you trust, it's a belief system. Do you believe the God of the universe knows you? Do you believe that the God of universe knows your life? Do you believe that the God of the universe is filtering all things? Nothing that happened to you yesterday, the day before, or the year before was not filtered through the hand of God. Do you believe that? Because if you don't, you will get anxious, right? But when you believe in the sovereignty of God and you trust him, then you can move into places that you've never been before. Then, he says, after you understand, don't be anxious, turn to me, he says, when, and when you turn to me, what should you do? With prayer and petition and thanksgiving, right? Prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. Now think about this. Too many times we forget this, right? We forget in the midst of all this to say, you know what, Lord, the situation that I'm in today filtered through you, I am thankful and I am thankful because at the end of the day, regardless of what happens to my life, I am your child. That's how you can be thankful in the midst of trial. That's how you can be thankful in the midst of cancer. That's how you can be thankful in the midst of financial problems. That's how you can be thankful in the midst of relationship problems. You can say, I am thankful because I am a child of God. And regardless of what happens to me on this earth, it doesn't change that I am a child of God and I will be in eternity with him someday. I'm thankful. But then he comes back and says, but petition me for change. petition me for change. Think about this, right? He is saying, listen, Ashton, don't forget this. The God of the universe, Jesus Christ on this earth who raised people from the dead, who take mute people and they could speak, deaf people and they could hear, blind people now could see, said to Ashton, when I leave here, Ashton will do more than I ever did on this earth. You're not like, wow, because I'm kind of like, wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he raised people from the dead, and he's telling Ashton, you're going to do more than that, dude. You know, I'm sitting back there thinking, holy crap, right? Like, if that can happen, then I'm petitioning God when there's cancer. I'm petitioning God when life's out of control. I'm petitioning God when my kids are not saved. I'm petitioning God when my financial situation is out of control because he's the God of the universe who said, through me, we will do more than you could have ever done while Jesus Christ was on this earth. Through you, I'm petitioning. And I'm asking because I believe in a God that wants to use me and you to change the world. And you know why? This is so important. Don't miss this. You know what he says at the end of that? Because then you're going to get a peace that surpasses what? All understanding. Why is that important? When you do things, when you do them in prayer and petition and you make yourself a vessel, so this is what, this is what we know, so just keep using Ashton, right? He's gonna say to Ashton, listen, Ashton is going to do some things that his friends are going to look at him and say, I have no idea how he's doing that. No idea. Like, there's no possible way he should be, ever be able to do that, right? No way in the world. And Ashton gets to say, I know! <laughs> Isn't that cool? The only way I could have ever through this circumstance is because of Jesus. You want to know why the world doesn't ever see Jesus? Because by prayer and petition, we're not asking him to do things through us that are so amazing that the world is saying, what in the world happened to you? There's no way you could have done that. There's no way you could have taken that step. There's no way through this devastating thing that happened in, this, in your life that you could be praising the Lord. There's no way that you could have taken this courageous step and talked to and led to. And, you know what I mean? Like, we're not doing it. And people of the world's like, who's Jesus again? Like, I know you guys talk about him in church, but I've never seen him in the world. By prayer and petition, I want to be a vessel that when people see my life where they say, what in the world? There's no possible way 
not by his power, not by his education, not by his strength, not by anything that he could have ever done, but only by Jesus. And the world's going to be like, the reason it surpasses all understanding because the world's not going to get it, but they're going to start asking questions. Right? They're going to start asking questions because seeing a God that is now living and it's not just inside of this Bible, but it's inside of me. And inside of me, Paul would say to the Philippian church, that changes the game, right, when we live in that way. So he sets him up, and he's like, so you got to get your mind right. So part of getting your mind right, part of training your mind is understanding who you are as a child of God and that when things come up, you understand the sovereignty of God and that you get to the place by prayer and petition that you get used in a way that the whole world's not going to understand it, but you're going to reveal that Jesus is alive through you, right? Get your mind right think about that. Don't forget it. If somebody tries to get you off track, get back to that place. Then he says, uh, and he goes on and says this in verse 8. Now, verse 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true and whatever is noble and whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, right? So he's saying, I'm going to teach you what to think about. Right, I'm going to teach you how to train your mind. That's what today is. We teach you how to train your mind. And he starts off with this. He says, you have to start thinking inside of your mind or training your mind to determine what is true. How do you determine truth? Now, remember when I said, I don't know, maybe I've said this all year. People say, say it all the time, but I just feel like I've said it a lot more lately, how I think the church has made a shift over the past few years towards the middle. Remember when I talked about this, like I think there's this problem inside of the church. Part of what I think is the problem inside of the church is how truth is determined, right? So in our world today, think about this, how people determine truth. Truth determined in the world today is usually determined by what garners our emotions, right? So what makes us happy or, you know, like, I, yeah, like that's got to be true because if that's true, then I feel good about it, right? Like I feel good about saying that is true because that makes sense to me and it makes me feel good. And not only does it make me feel good, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't cause division, right? So I need to make decisions that are emotionally gratifying and that it doesn't cause division around the people around me so that there's harmony and feelings and they all go together and we all deem it in this thing, well, it's all about love, right? And that sounds good, doesn't it? Like that all sounds good. The problem then becomes, so that, that's some of what it is for the world, but the other problem becomes this. This is happening inside of the church, right? So here's what I think has happened inside of the church. So there's the Bible, and then a few authors, and then a few pastors, and then a few podcasters, and they're saying like, yeah, like there's some good stuff in here, and some good stuff in here, and this pastor said this, and this podcast said this, and this author said this, and our truth is determined by the collective group of people that match my opinion that fits me the most, what makes me happy, and which is least divisive. Okay? And I think the church has shifted that way. I think the church has started preaching more out of books than the book, right? Because the books are popular, right? Find a popular book that everybody likes and it makes everybody feel good. And I think preachers are preaching messages that are, that are messages that would say, I want you to walk out of here feeling encouraged and empowered. And, and I'm just telling you, if you preach out of here, it's not always encouraging, it's like rough sometimes, right? Like if you're going to what this really says, like it's rough to go through this. So I think the church has made this shift. And so as comparison, right? So people will talk about these. So we can just use some subjects and we'll try to put it to practice. So just use one of the popular controversial subjects in the world today, abortion, right? That's a controversial subject, isn't it? In the cultural world. And so people are making their decisions on where they stand in abortion, right? Based upon, again, how it makes a person feel. Am I right? Are we wrong? Are we, right? Like, how does it make people feel, and is it divisive or not? Right? Is the decision divisive or not? So when people come, and Christians, is that how we should make our decision on where we stand on abortion? 
And is it even where we stand? Is this about where Life Church or the church stands? No. Where do we go back to? Where do Christians find their truth? So you can't ignore what this says, right? On any, tub, any subject. Like it, ha- it says something. Now, again, there's going to be a lot of things that raise some like tension and there's going to be a lot of situations. There are going to people say, what about this situation? And what about this situation? And what about this thing? And they're going to put all this together. And I'm like, I don't know about all these things. I only know what this says. Like the truth of scripture says this, and it was never about my opinion, your feelings or my feelings, division or not division, because at the end of the day, he says joy, not feelings, right? And he says that at the end of the day, for us, it's not about division or not division, because if you stand on the word of God, you will be divided with the world. It's not about unity. You can't create unity. He says from the beginning, you will be opposed. Why in the world you're ever trying to make this fit everybody? It doesn't. It doesn't. And why we're preaching messages that try to gloss over, and I said this all the time, this is part of the problem. This is why we don't preach through books of the Bible anymore. Because you, if you're going to say, hey, I'm going to preach all the way through a book of the Bible, at some point you're going to have to skip some parts if you don't want to talk about them then. Right? Instead of like, hey, here's some great topics. Are you excited? Come to church and we're going to talk about how to get a girlfriend, you know, in seven days. Right? And here's what the Bible says about you getting your girlfriend and how to be able to do it. Right? Like, and we'll tell you the scriptural references on how to find the right girl. And I'm not even saying that's wrong, but you see my point? And it's not wrong to talk about some of those things. But I'm just telling you, if you preach through this sucker, there are some things in here that are difficult to hear. And that people aren't walking away like, wow, that was a good one. <laughs> right? Like, people aren't like, oh, man, he was on fire today. He's like, holy cow. You know, that made half the church mad and half the church happy, and now they're mad at each other because one's happy and one's mad, right, on where they stand on things. I'm like, listen, I'm only telling you what it says. Paul's saying, listen, if you're going to have a foundation, if you're going to stand firm, and if you're going to be used, this is is really important. You have to know where the truth is because I can't use somebody that wavers with public opinion. I can't. I can't use somebody that when, the, when it gets rough, when hard decisions got to be made, that all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm over here. Yeah, I want to just make sure everybody's happy. And he's like, I can't use you over here. Get back over there, right? I can only use you as a vessel when you're willing to stand against persecution, when you're willing to stand against opposition, when, when you're willing to stand on truth, then God can work in the world. And when we're petitioning, standing on truth, God's going to do things in this world way beyond whatever you could ask for and imagine and use you in a way that people are going to say something's changed in his life and it has to be Jesus because it couldn't happen anywhere else. Right? Then he goes on and he says, not just about truth. He says, you need to do some things that are honorable, right? You need to to dwell on things that are honorable. And so inside of that, he's saying, bigger than just truth, you gotta dwell on some things that are about, you know, uh, heavenly things, right? Not just earthly things. Because at times, don't we get a little bit distracted on on dwelling on things that that really don't matter? You know what I mean? Things that kind of get us off pace and we don't really think about heavenly things and dwell on heavenly things. Just like last night, um, and I'm, you know, I wish I was way more disciplined than this, but I don't know how this happened. So last night I get done working and it's like four o'clock or whatever. And I sit down, we eat and I like, I'm going to just look at what's on Netflix. And oh my gosh, here we go. So then I found this thing called the fastest car and it was about built cars against bought cars. And so it was like McLarens against all these Mustangs that started at four o'clock and at 1130 last night, I'm like, I better go to bed. <laughs> I'm like, what just happened to me? You know, like, I, well, other than now I want to build a car and I want to, you know, find a shop and I want to, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like all in about building a muscle car now. Other than that, but you see what I'm saying? You know how easy it is to get distracted on things that don't really matter? You know, how easy it is to get caught up into things that get you off track. That's all I'm saying. He's like, don't get so sucked into things that are going to get you off track. Dwell on some heavenly things. Go out and actually talk to somebody instead of watching about fast cars for the last eight hours of your day. Right? Like maybe call somebody or text somebody or, you know, something that, you know, is going to help from a relationship standpoint. But he says, you got you to gotta dwell on things that are honorable. 
He also says you have to dwell on things that are right. Okay, now listen. The law of God is inside of Scripture for a reason. And the reason isn't to make you feel bad about the way that you're living your life. The law of God, and and we need to dwell on the law of God and what is in here. Because the law of God is put there for guardrails in your life. Okay? Those guardrails are to keep you from ending up in the ditch. Right? They are to keep you from, because once you get in the ditch, the, the truck's a whole lot harder to get out than just to pound out a dent. Like if you run up against the guardrail, spray some new paint on it, pound the dent out, hey, we're good. You end up in the ditch and it's flipped over. Now you got water damage and your axles are bad and it's a total. It's hard to restore. You can still be restored, but he'd rather restore the dents than he would the complete brokenness, right? So we can't ignore what the law of God is and what we should be studying because it's there for a reason. Don't go buy it. Don't be like, I could never live it out. That's not the point. The point is know it so you can understand the guardrails of your life so you don't end up in the ditch. You know, and then he also goes on. Another thing that he would say is that we should do what is right, dwell on what is right, and also what is pure. Think about this for a second. I don't know where you are on what goes through your eyes, but remember this, okay? The eyes are a window to the soul. What goes through these eyes has an effect on your soul. I don't know what you're watching, what you're scrolling through, or what you're a part of, but remember, we need to evaluate what goes through these eyes and evaluate what we're watching and what we're seeing because we need to understand that purity of mind leads to a purity of life. And you can't have a purity of mind if what's going through those eyes is impure. Right? So think about what's going in. Right? It's the easy thing we used to always say to our kids. Garbage in is garbage out. Right? Like, listen, you got to understand you're not just going to be like, oh, this doesn't affect me. No, it actually does affect you. Like, what you're watching, what you're viewing, it does affect you in those ways. Right? Then he goes on. And he says, also what is lovely, so dwell on not only what is pure, uh, but what is lovely. Like, what does the Bible say about the things that are good, right? What are the things that, that are lovely? Like creation, right? Like, you can look out, like I've always said, you go out and you sit in the woods and you're hunting, you look around and you're like, oh, man, this is what I needed, right? Like, this is good, and I don't know what it is for you. Everybody has their own thing, but you need to get to the place where we look around and, and, and we're saying, like, yes, these are the things that are lovely. These are things from God, and I'm so, you know, overwhelmed by the things of God, and that we dwell on that, and that we remember that. And then he also says this, that we dwell on what is praiseworthy. Now, I know this seems kind of weird to guys, like guys don't ever write anything down. I'm always like, you should probably have a journal. A journal? I don't read and write anything down. You know, that's not what guys do. I'm saying, listen, I would tell you to have a, a praise journal, and you can write it in your phone if that's more manly, you know, or whatever you want to do. Like, but you should have something where you, every day, when something happens in your life, you're like, I'm praising God for that moment. You should write it down because there's going to be a time in life when it sucks that you need to go back and remember that God is still praiseworthy. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Speaking from experience, there are times when life just starts hitting and you forget that God is still a God who loves you and worthy of praising because right now it doesn't seem like it, right? And the reason that we write these things down is so we can go back and remember in the midst of the the things that are happening in our life, God is still a God worthy of praising praise. And so however you do that, I mean, a lot of people are like, well, I can always remember. Listen, I I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true, but you need to have it because there are going to be some times. Remember, this is all about your mind. What's he trying to do? So when you, when the storms of life come in, what do you think Satan's trying to do? Occupy you, keep you down, keep you depressed. And sometimes it's hard to break out of that until you go back and say, I need to physically look at and be reminded that God is good. God is faithful. God is praiseworthy. Be reminded that in the midst of all of this, he is still the God of the universe that's in control, right? That he's still in control of everything in our life. And so now the worship team's gonna come back up and I wanna give you this last part of it because this is, for me at least, when we look at this, 
this is what ties it all together. So Paul saying to the Philippian church, like, you need to get, you know, anchored. You need to have a foundation. You need to put yourself in this place. You need to, to by prayer and petition, don't be anxious. And you need to change the way that you think and dwell on the things that, that matter and understand truth and do all of that stuff, right? Like, you need to change the way that you are thinking, but the way that he ends this, I think is so incredibly important because if we don't apply this, then all of it doesn't make sense. He says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, okay, that all that stuff that he just talked about, you just learned what to do when you're anxious. You just learned, like, here's some things you should dwell on. Helps change your mind, right? Helps you understand how to determine truth. Like, you've learned some things Philippian church, you've learned some things, life church, of how to change the way that you think, and then he ends it with this when he says, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I'm going to say this in the nicest way possible, and I'm not very good at it, so just take it for what it's worth. We don't need any more Bible scholars that aren't doing anything. We got plenty of them. We don't need any more small groups that study scripture and do nothing. We don't need more people that can memorize scripture, but their life never changes, right? Richard Stern wrote this book, The Hole in the Gospel. If you've never read it, it's an incredible book. I recommend that you read it. And here's what he said. Part of the problem with the church today is this. You focused on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Focus on getting your life right and your relationship right. But the actions of your life carrying out the gospel into the lives of other people is completely missing. There is a big hole, and it makes no sense. Too many times, we inside of the church are good at coming, taking notes, writing things down, doing your devotions every single day, and then when the actions of our life called for us to change something in our life, to do something in our life, we just can't get it done. You know, I said this, and and you guys have heard this story before, but I want to remind you again because it's what I thought of for my own self this week. When we came to the place where um, we were trying to make a decision on whether or not we took in the kids, you know, if you don't know, we took in five kids, started off, they were just going to be at our house for a while until the parents got their life right, until the parents not coming back. And we're sitting here, and now we're realizing the parents aren't coming back. And so we're seeking advice from people in the church. What should we do? You know, what, what do you do? I mean, five kids, we live in a small house. I don't make that much money, you know. These kids bring, on, bring things, do you know what I mean? Like, their whole life wasn't always perfect, right? So they, it, they come with stuff. And so I ask people in the church, like, well, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Do you know what? And they'd go through the list, you know, what it'll do to your kids. You know what it could corrupt your kids. You know, all that stuff. And one of the proudest moments of my life was when we sat around the table with our kids. Today, here's the deal. Here's where we're at. Kids are all like, it's funny because our kids were sleeping on cots because they gave those kids the beds, you know, because they wanted this to happen. And they're said, so we're like, what do you think we should do? Because I want you to realize this. We're probably not going on vacation the way we used to go on vacation. And just so you understand, this 1,600 square foot house isn't going to be like this anymore. Like, we're going to have to make some changes. Some things are going to have to be different. We sat around this table and we talked to the kids and they looked at us and they said, is this even a decision? What does scripture say? Pure and faultless religion is taking care of the orphan and the widow why is this even a discussion if they're in their home scripture says it's a mandate not a suggestion it is a mandate I get it there's a lot of things that go with it you know what I mean a lot of struggles that go with it but what do we believe to be true you know, one of the, again, with that same thing is, is like the kids went one Sunday to talk over in a church in Adams County about what was going on. You know, might be another one of my proudest moments of my children. And one of the older ladies in the congregation said, Brady was up there speaking, said, hey, 
how hard was it for you and sacrifice and all that? And Brady looked out there and said, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard. And I'm like, yeah. I wasn't there, but when they're telling me the story, I'm like, that's my son. You know, I'm like, we don't have to be politically correct because he said, it was never about our sacrifice. It was never about what it cost us. It was never about any of those things. It was about we are Christians called to do and we're going to do. Cost to us means nothing. I'm like, thank you, Lord, I needed it. From the, the mouth of a babe through the eyes of a child, faith through children makes sense. All of those other things, you know, that we were trying to factor it in and church people were trying to factor it in to make it all make sense. The faith of a child makes sense. Is this what it says? Then do it. And that's what I think he's asking each one of us today. Be a doer of the word. Dwell on what is true and what is right. Put your anchor on. Don't get moved, right? I want to use you to change the world, but I need you here and available and ready to go because I want to use you. Petition me because I want to change this world. I want to use you in amazing ways. Will we as a church train our mind to remember those things, to be used in ways that the world's going to look at and say, I don't get it. And we can say the same thing. I don't get it either. The only thing I know is what is true. Jesus Christ is my not only savior, he is my king. And I will fight for my king in whatever he asks me to do. Will you stand so I can pray for you? Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, knowing and understanding that um, there is a battle going on for our mind. And Lord, when we know the battle is out there, we need to be prepared. Paul teaches us today to be prepared. Don't be anxious. Don't try to, to get sucked into this idea that you can control everything but because you, you can't, right? Understand, petition you, Lord. That's what we're doing today, Lord. We're petitioning you. We're saying we will stand for what is true. We will dwell on what is right and honorable and lovely and all of those things. We will, we will think of things that are praiseworthy. But more than that, Lord, use us. Let us get out of this culture of learning more about Scripture and doing nothing. May we be a church that stands on truth and our lives are dictated by the way that we think and the things that we do by what you've asked us to do and how to live. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. It's your breath in our lives, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives, so we pour out our praise to you only. 
to allow this to be our challenge. Remember, there is a war going on. Nobody that understands a war sits around and waits for the enemy to come, but gets prepared. May we be a people that are getting prepared. May we be a people that would understand what's at stake. And may we be people, and may we be a church that stands firm in the midst of opposition. May we be a church that doesn't just read truth, but lives out truth. And may we be a people that are used in such ways that the world's going to say, far beyond what could ever been asked for or imagined, something that surpasses all understanding, the way that we live our lives brings glory to God and to God alone. So again, we encourage you guys, keep coming back. Like this just keeps building every week. And I think it's such a timely thing and getting us ready for maybe what is happening right now or what's to come. And we want to learn together through all this. So thanks for being with us here in person. Thanks for being with us online. And we'll see you guys again next week.